return. Tenel Kangert sitting at the back for the Astana team. And these three, Lutsenko, Van Avama and Vokla, trying to bridge across. They're at 30 seconds, one kilometre to the top, as the green jersey wearer is at the front of the peloton. And I'm joined by a man who's won that jersey three times, Robbie McEwen, the green jersey at the front. Peter Sagan is bringing a whole new meaning to the points classification. He is Mr. Everything. He certainly is, and... <sighs> It's never a surprise anymore to see him in a breakaway in the mountains because he's done it so often over the last couple of years. It may not be a surprise, but it's always impressive. Thomas Vockler, they want to bridge this gap or get near enough by the time they get to the top so they can join them on the descent. They've been wanting to bridge that gap from the moment they took off about 70 kilometres ago and haven't been able to do it. And just shows you how hard the riders in front are prepared to work because they think we've got enough guys up here we don't need any more competition and a big part of the driving force has been peter sagan he's led all the way up the climbs for rafael maker and if vukler and van avermaet don't get on over the top they're going to have a lot of trouble getting on at all because peter sagan is sure to lead this, the descent as well and we know what he's like downhill how many people can say i caught peter sagan on a descent I'm not sure anyone's been able to say it yet. That's what I thought. And you can see the Astana rider at the back here. This is Tanel Kanga. He's got a teammate chasing, which is Lutsenko. So he's not contributing to the pacemaking at this point. He's waiting for his teammate to come across. But they're out in front because they have a plan for later on in the hope that Fabio Aru can make an impact. He's currently in 10th position, and he said he's not happy with the situation. Well, I'm not sure the teammates are going to be able to do much from there with a 10-minute lead, so that pretty much nullifies Astana having two riders in front because by the time Aru gets to these guys, if he does, they'll be going up a 10% plus gradient climb as Rafael Maker takes the points. He adds to his total, and I think Thomas de Kent can wave goodbye. Thomas de Kent suggest by not getting in the breakaway he might have tried as we see Vokler sprinting not for the points because there's no points on offer he's sprinting as you mentioned before to get in contact before they start going downhill and it's a long descent followed by a long valley road and a little bit of an arm sling practicing perhaps to ride the Madison at future world championships Van Abermont of this group is going to be crucial on the way down he will be in the body language of Van Avermaet. He looks like he's really on the limit. Got the shoulders rocking all over the place. This is Alaphilippe, Serge Poles. And just sitting on the back of those two is Alberto Losada from the Katusha team. These three, they are chasing behind Van Avermaet, Vukler and Lutsenko. And they have even less chance of getting on to that Peter Sagan led group. When there was a stage of the Tour d'Avenir to this finish line in 2006, it was an individual time trial. Steph Clement, who's in the breakaway, he won the stage. The only other rider from the top 10 that day that is in the race is Serge Pals, who's in this break trying to go across. So they've obviously got good memories of the area. Almost over the top, Julian Alaphilippe wearing the red number today after that big adventure off the front with Tony Martin. How impressed have you been with Julian Alaphilippe? Well, he just doesn't have an off button, does he? All day yesterday with Tony Martin in the front and up the road again. But it's one thing to be able to get in the break day after day, but every time you do, you're using precious energy that you don't have to utilise the next day. And you see now, he's not able to keep up with the guys who are trying to go across Van Avermaet, Vukler. He can't follow them. Any other day, you would have thought... Alaphilippe will follow those guys. He's a winner of the Tour of California. He's performed well in the mountains, but it really does start to eat into those reserves. And you just don't have the same amount of energy at your disposal when you go so often. Which can draw us to a conversation about the riders battling for the top five, the top ten, or the podium, in fact, and trying to challenge Chris Froome. Everybody's been asking, when do the attacks come? They've got to attack. But you've got to economise with your energy. Because if you look at Van Avermaet and Alaphilippe Fresh... Julian Alaphilippe is a better climber than Greg Van Avermaet. 
We've seen how much energy that Philip has spent. He hasn't been able to recuperate. So when you look back to that top 10, and a lot of people have been saying, when are they going to attack Chris Froome? They haven't wasted energy to this point. And they can't afford to because these four days are enormous. And they're going to attack when they think the moment has come that they can take it all the way. It's no good going out on an audacious attack and then being like a car running out of fuel stranded on the side of the road the bunch comes back past and you've blown yourself up so the riders they know themselves very well from training from using the power meters going on their heart race but at this end of a grand tour it's all about feeling and someone needs to take the risk of running out of gas losing everything they've got at the moment a top 10 place or a top five place on gc risk see that going out the window to try and move higher a fourth or fifth place overall, yes, it's good. It's a good performance, but nobody's going to remember it except your family. Get out and have a go. And Richie Port is one of the names that comes up in this conversation. Richie Port is in seventh position, four minutes and 27 seconds down. But his legs have shown that he's good enough for third. He's good enough to be on the podium. It's just that puncher that he had on stage two. He's made the point that the final three kilometres today seem to go forever. Therefore, I'm not expecting Richie to move until we're inside the last three Ks today. Well, you've got to go at a point, like I said, that you know you can go all the way to the finish, full gas, not run out and start to give that time back. And uh, I agree with Richie. This climb seems to go on forever, and I did it in the car. As I was driving up, The both climbs, in fact, they're separated by a technical, steep, fast descent. It'll be... It'll be over in no time, that descent. So it'll seem like one big climb today, but it's steep enough to really make the differences. There's no sitting on. There's going to be no slipstream on this climb. It's incredibly hot as well, 35 degrees. This will be a race of attrition. Even without guys attacking, there'll be guys getting dropped, and he who can attack is the man who will move up a lot. And I reckon we can see Richie get himself up towards top three, maybe top four by the end of today. day before we rode into Bern and the riders looked forward to a rest day. Everybody on the limit. Everybody was on the limit, but there was still a bit of margin there. Even Chris Froome threw out that fake attack and Roman Bardet, he was the only one who really dared to do something, tried to get onto that descent by himself to try and steal some time. He can really throw it down a hill, but they caught him right before the top. He is a joy to watch go downhill. The Movistar team, they wear the yellow helmets as the leaders of the team's classification. They've got the yellow numbers on as well. In second place is Team Sky. But Sky won't be concerned about the team's classification because they've got the yellow that they really want. Gorka Izaguirre crashed out today, broken collarbone, no longer here. Jesus Herrada, who won a stage at the recent Criterium de Dauphiné, is no longer here. That weakens Movistar in the mountains significantly. How do you think it will change the strategy for Valverde and Quintana? I don't think it will weaken Movistar as a team in the mountains. If you're not defending yellow, I feel from this point on in the tour... It doesn't matter how many teammates you've got around you because it becomes so mountainous. Because in just a few kilometres, this race goes up and it's all mountains all the way to the second last day. So having teammates, there's not really much they can do for you uphill. The Team Sky Riders, yes, they set the pace, control the peloton. Chris, Scott, uh, Chris Room can relax behind the Sky team and just follow along. But going uphill, there's not a slipstream you can sit in, there's not so much of a chase you can do, it's going to come down to who can follow and then who can attack on top of that. Be handy though to have well poles. He can neutralise attacks for Chris Froome, but the, the thing is that Froome still has to do the pedalling, he has to put out the wattage to close the gap as well, that's the problem, it's not like sitting on the flat and sitting in the slipstream, if you have a guy like Pools closing the gap, you have to at least be able to follow him and if you blow up, teammate, mate. Yeah, if you can't do the job, it doesn't matter how good your team is. 
Breakaway group of 11 with an advantage of almost 11 minutes. Dominico Pozzovivo from AG to R Le Mondial is just tagged onto the back. They had good news, Robbie, on the rest day. The sponsor has extended yet again. They've been in the peloton for a long time now, AG to R Le Mondial. They've confirmed that they'll be on board at the minimum to the end of 2020. Lutsenko and Van Abermann charging down as Thomas Vockler. I wonder what face he's pulling at this point. Eyes wide shut. This is Lusada, Pals, and Alaphilippe. And for my money, these three are going a lot slower than the three in front of them. And doesn't look like the trio of uh, Van Avermaet, etc., are making much ground on that front group. I'd like to get a shot of Peter Sagan right at the moment. I'm sure, he's tucked down on top of that top tube. Raphael Maker right behind him. Sagan's task from now. One will be to hold that gap for Raphael Maker, get him to the bottom of that climb that Maker can try and get more points and try and win the stage, and for Sagan to take the points of the intermediate sprint, and that'll be a successful day for Peter Sagan. And he's already got himself in a position to do so. They're over the first two climbs, descend, valley road, intermediate sprint, 20 more p points for Peter Sagan, and then it is almost all uphill, the final 33 kilometres to the finish. There's just a short... Five, seven kilometre descent there in the middle. Shane Archbold in his first Tour de France, Robbie, holding on to the back. He's ridden well. It's going to be a pretty good day out as far as mountain stages go for Shane Archbold and all the other sprinters who traditionally struggle in the mountains and have the enemy of the time limit. Get over those first Cat 3s and then they get a free ride to the foot of the climb. Of course, they have to ride up. It's going to be tough but they should have no problem at all with the time limit today. But there is that little thing of the 11-minute gap to the front and a guy like Raphael Maker. So they'll be starting 11 minutes behind, so that it shrinks the time gap effectively for them, so they're going to have to ride pretty hard still. He's got some pedigree, Dan Martin, as we take in the scenery of Switzerland. It's been a wonderful 48 hours or so through Switzerland, up now into the Alps, and just enjoying the backdrop. Throughout the tour, particularly as we head down through the Loire, that sort of region, we talk a lot about the shadows. But man-made items cannot compete with Mother Nature at her very best. And today, Robbie, she's showing off. Oh, she is indeed. And this is Le Mont d'Or, Gold Mountain. And the scenery around, I was going to say this part of Switzerland, but any part of Switzerland, I've just, I drive along going towards the stage finishes and I'm in awe. I've got out on the bike a couple of days as well. Just beautiful to ride. I stuck to the flatlands, riding around the lakes. The lakes were wonderful. Had the opportunity on the rest day yesterday to go for a swim. You heard the wheels of the car screeching through the corners. Van Avermaet and Lutsenko have made contact. Thomas Vockler is not quite there. Just briefly back to Dan Martin. He's got some pedigree. His uncle is Stephen Roach, who won the Tour de France in 1987. Stephen Roach, his sister is the mother of Dan Martin. And Dad, Dan's father, Neil, was the British National Road Champion. So as a racehorse, he would have been expensive to buy. And Thomas Vockler is not a bad descender, but do you remember that moment in 2011 into Pinerolo, descending a really tricky descent, and he thought, I'm in yellow, Contador, the likes of Schleck and Kidal Evans, they can take time on me on the way up. I'll take a few risks on the way down. And he went off the road into somebody's driveway and almost picked himself up a cup of coffee. He went off the road not once but twice on that descent. Full risk to hold the jersey that day. And he's taken the risks to get on and now on to that group. The question is how much energy have those guys spent in the chase to join the breakaway in the front of the race? As we look at Le Lac de Longrain. This was formed in 1960 as a result of a dam that was built here. But it is fed by uh, the snow melting water and also got some water pumped into it from Lake Geneva. You can go for a swim here. And there's two arches. We get a chance to take a look at one of them. One of them stands at 95 metres tall. The other one, 123 metres tall. Another one of the beautiful lakes. And the water yesterday in the lake that I had the chance to go for a swim in was surprisingly warm. I jumped in nervously. Were you so nervous that you made the water warm? Is that what you're saying, Matthew? Not quite. <laughs> Not quite. 
beautifully fresh in those lakes. Uh, we also got in for a swim yesterday. I managed to get in a lap of the Beal at the sea, the Lake of Beal, 35, 37 kilometres around. Had a barbecue, a swim, and then I did another lap in the opposite direction. Fantastic rest day. Also, the quick step riders, they enjoyed a swim on their rest, rest day. Did some bridge jumping in Burn. Sat into the flowing river. As soon as you jump in, you're 50 metres from the bridge you jumped off and then swam to the bank and then went back to their bikes. Looked fun. Van Avermaet in red. He's made contact. So too is Lutsenko and Thomas Vokler. They now make this a leading group of 14 riders. It's been a good race for Greg Van Avermaet and for BMC... Well, Greg Van Avermaet, he can't do a lot to support Richie Port once we get into the mountains, the last couple of climbs today. But it's good for their morale to have Greg Van Avermaet in the breakaway, surely. It's good for the team to have a rider and have some representation in that breakaway. But Greg Van Avermaet, he's also pretty much got one speed when he races, and that's flat out. If there's a race on, he'll race it. He finds it very hard to just sit back. Because also at this time gap now of 11 and a half minutes, same goes for Van Avermaet as for the riders from Astana. Not much they can do for a teammate in this position because if they get caught, when they get caught, it's going to be on the steepest part of this final climb. And their team leaders, their team leaders will go past them so quick, it'll almost be a blur. The group with Julian Alaphilippe is now drifting out at almost two minutes behind. Brees Filo has managed to get himself into the breakaway. He had fond memories when we went to Andorra. That's the only race he's won. A mountaintop finish, almost the queen stage of that year's Tour de France, on debut, and he managed to win with his brother there to enjoy it with him. Maybe all of their budget went towards paying their salaries. There was nothing left to get a hire car. Well, the rest of the team, they came up here in the car and they were really smiling at lunch. They thought it was hilarious. The peloton moving along pretty quickly now as they go along the valley road. I'm sure that Luke Rowe and Ian Stannard will pick up the tempo because that's the last part of the course where they can really help Chris Froome. And although they're not too worried about that breakaway group, they just don't want to let it go out to a silly sort of a margin. And that thing that I was saying earlier about it won't matter as much having teammates in the mountains unless, of course, you are the leader. And we've seen Team Sky on a number of occasions ride a little bit slower uphill at the pace set by Stannard and Rowe to keep them on board to ride in the valleys. That's where it's really important for a team leader, the guy leading the race, to have teammates to do that sort of work. But if you're a Quintana or a Richie Port not leading the race, well, everybody's just sitting on sitting in the line along those valleys. It makes no difference to them because once the race goes uphill, it starts to split and they're on their own, them against Chris Froome. That's the point I'm making. Two riders from IM Cycling in the breakaway. One of them is Steph Clement, the Dutchman that rides for the Swiss team, and he knows these roads very well. He was here in 2006 riding the Tour Avenir, which is the race of the future, the crystal ball towards the Tour de France, a race that Nardo Quintana has won in the past. So given that he's won here before, we thought it best to catch up with Steph Clement before the stage got underway. Here he is talking before the stage, and now he's in the breakaway. Um, it was an uphill time trial, and uh, most of the time you take a normal bike. I did it in the morning with uh, my uh, teammate uh, Mathieu uh, Sprik, and then I decided to take the time trial bike, and in the end uh, I win, I guess, with four seconds, so the winner is always right. I, I said last week that I will try every day, um, so I will again. Uh, of course, uh, the finish line today is, uh, I think, eight kilometers further uh, up the hill than it was uh, back in 2006. But um, we'll try and we'll see, but uh, memories are forever and uh, today is, uh, we'll see what it brings. You know, it's going to be a long, tough climb when we hear it's eight kilometres further up the road today than what it was in 2006. Race Radio just talking about a crash and it's... Shane Archbold from Bora Argon 18, who we was talking about earlier on, about how well he's been surviving the climbs. That is going to make life so tough for a guy that's not a natural climber. Let's hope that Shane's OK. He can get back on, get through the day, survive inside the time delay. But, Robbie, you're not the one on the ground, yet you're still grimacing. You know what it feels like. 
it's such a horrible feeling when you go down at speed. And on the upside, he's already on his feet. That's a good thing. You want to see the rider up and about, but he looks like he's in terrible pain because that is a very fast part of the course on that descent. So hopefully Shane Archibald is able to jump back on and continue. He's a tough man. It's going to take every bit of toughness to get back on and get through this stage. A shame to see that happen. He is coffin nails tough, Shane Archibald. I've seen him crash on the track riding Omniums, pick himself back up and finish the race with skin just hanging off his body, but he presses on. Breakaway group once again. Greg Van Avermaet from BMC. Thomas Vockler, the man who can never be accused of being two-faced. He's got around about 100. <laughs> This is Jurasek from Lamprey. He looks fairly comfortable. Brice Filou from Fortuneo Vital Concepts. Dominic Copot of Vivo. First time in the Tour de France, it's hard to believe. He's won mountain stages at the Giro d'Italia. Steph Clement just going through the rider that we heard from before. Well, the peloton really is moving as they make their way down. And look at the vineyards. This is what I was talking about earlier on. It makes you a fraction thirsty for a crisp white wine as you drive through here. But Peter Sagan has got himself into the break, and he won the stage into Bern, where a lot of the Swiss wanted to pay homage to Fabian Cancellara. And Sagan told the story about his first Tour de France, and he was in the breakaway with Fabian Cancellara, who was wearing the yellow jersey at the time, having won the prologue in Liège. And when they were in the breakaway together, Peter Sagan said to Fabian Cancellara, I want to beat you and win a stage of the Tour de France. He told him directly. And he thinks that at that time, Fabian Cancellara was a little bit angry with him. Who's this upstart? Now they've got a great relationship together. And Peter Sagan made it pretty clear he wanted to beat him because of his respect for him. And maybe he didn't get the finesse of the message quite right with his English, which is his third language. He speaks very well now, but was only just learning at that point. Well, lots of uh, shouts of encouragement there for uh, Micah. He's become very popular and he, uh, well, there's a move there. There's an acceleration coming from the front and that is Tony Gallopin. Frenchman on Team uh, Lotto, and there's no reaction at all there. He was at the front, he could feel the uh, tempo, and he could feel the work that was happening, and he goes straight out on the attack. Gallopin, well, if he wants to get himself something out of this stage, he needs to build up a, a big advantage before we start the final climb of the day, because Jarlinson Pantano is an extreme, there's another move now, they, this is the moment when they've started to say, okay, well we've all been friends so far, and now's the moment when we really need to go out on the attack, that looked like Lutsenko made the move there, number 26 from Astana, he's got a teammate in the back, uh, Tanel Kangat, and there's no response there. Well, you know, we're looking at 27 kilometres to go. Uh, Tony Gallopin, he hasn't actually had a win since last year when he won a small criterium or an exhibition race in Calais. And before that, his last victory was way back in Paris-Nice in March 2015. Roberto, it is Alexis Lutsenko who's coming across there at the moment. And uh, Tony Gallopin... We'll, we'll welcome the extra help, I think, because it's still uh, 2017 miles or 27 kilometres of racing left. But apart from the short descent to get on to the last climb, it's all uphill now. Well, now just look at this, Paul. These are beautiful structures. There's lots of these in Switzerland because it's such a hilly country. And they've managed to tame nature with these wonderful uh, viaducts here. Well, some serious uh, engineering in this part of the world, uh, whether it's the incredible viaducts we see or whether it's the tunnels. But the main field now there, you see, Phil, that little roundabout, that is the start of the climb. And in fact, uh, I was hearing over race radio that Trek Segafredo and, of course, a Movistar have come to the front to really lay it down. But look at that. The white jerseys of Trek Segafredo in the second row there waiting to try and launch their man, Balko Molima, into a good position. This is the way it had to be today. The two riders, uh, Bauke Molima for Trek and Nairo Quintana, they've got to come up here now. We should also look out for the white jersey as well of Adam Yates on the Orica Bike Exchange team. 
already riders slipping off the back of the race. This is just a long, steady slog over the plains of the vineyards, the Col de la Forcla. Then we get the descent. Then we'll turn to the right. I hope they turn to the right because they come down so quick to this right turn. And then they start the climb up. Well, well the continues descent for a little bit longer. Well, the yeah, the climb is not very, uh, the descent is not very long, maybe four or five kilometres, and there's a very sharp turn to the right-hand side, and that's when the final climb of the day starts. I would say uh, forget about uh, clamps and, uh, and things to get up the mountain today. Maybe the best thing would be to have a, a parachute on the back because there's a certain amount of paraglide. These two riders are now starting to build up quite an advantage. They've got about 20 to 25 seconds, and there's been no response at all from any of the other riders. I get the feeling that Rafael Maika is biding his time, as he did on the other day when we went to, down to uh, Kulos, and so too is Pantano. Pantano there moving up into third position in the white jersey. Well, there's Rui Costa, I think it is, and he is in trouble at the back of the peloton right now. A lot of this whole group has been detached here. Steve Cummings is here as well, the British rider. And I'm hearing that, I think it's, uh, uh, I think it's Samuel de Moulin has been distanced there, not Tom. But I'm not sure, because they're not showing the distinction. Well, this first part of the climb will be a sorting out process. In fact, you can already start to see just at the front of that line a small nucleus of riders forming. What you'll have is uh, 10 or 15 riders at the back trying to hold on to position. Well, in fact, uh, that's John Deckencob. All the sprinters in this group now, they've gone. They're done for the day. Just their job to get home now. They won't, won't worry about the race that's still to come. These are the two leaders. Alexis Lutsenko is the rider at the back former under 23 road race champion and in front of him as we still have 7.8 kilometers nearly five miles to climb to the top of this goal tony gallopan though he could handle this well i think he needs to get himself a, a little bit of a start before he starts this final climb of the final climb of the day for because this climb i mean it really is a beast driving up at this morning it almost took your breath away number eight there just slipping away that's big old ian stannard his job done on the flat part of the stage also slipping away luke rowe he's one of the flat men the, the important riders on the flat part of any stage for team sky now they're handing it over to monsieur les grimpeurs as they say in french the climbers on team sky well, the lifting of the pace is basically done by a team at Movistar at the moment. There they are at the front and driving as well as they continue to pile up the front. Winner Anna Connor as we go up around the vineyards again. This really lifting the tempo now. It's come on the climb before the finish climb. That's what they have to do. Indication today is to see just how that man there wearing number 11 is going. Has he been playing a poker game? Has he got the form? He's talked throughout the whole of the build-up to the Tour de France about these next four days. Well, Astana, who uh, really haven't got a leader right now, uh, but they're keeping a lot of men up on that leaderboard, and the Nibali said that he doesn't want to win, but they need to lift Fabio Aru a little bit higher up. Well, I think, Phil, anybody in this race who's been careful with their uh, energy through the first uh, two weeks of this race, they're going to benefit from these last four days in the Alps because if you're feeling fresh, you could pull back 30 seconds to a minute every day over the next four days, and that could completely change the look of the overall classification. That tunnel can got coming back from the chase group there towards the peloton. He's been picked up. Flag of Wales on the corner there. And a change of jersey for Peter Sagan because he's happy now just to ride home today. Well, consolidated in that green jersey. It just gives you an idea of... It's got to get his radio sorted out. It just gives you an idea of how powerful this man can be. Uh, let's not forget, Phil, he's riding up a first category climber, changing his attire. I would suggest that he's probably taken off his undervest, which he had on earlier on, because over the next part of this race, he's going to get very, very warm. Happy days for Peter Sagan. Now, there's the glacier running off the side of Mont Blanc there, and uh, it's uh, called, well, it was briefly called up, but I think it is actually the glacier that's outside our hotel window. Well, this is the, the glacier of Argentière, which is just uh, on the other side of Chamonix. You can just see it there. They're magnificent, these glaciers. And, um, plenty of people. I was surprised and amazed at how many people came through uh, Chamonix. A town of only 10,000 people gets 100,000 visitors a day. Oh, it's a lovely place. It's nestling in the heart of the Alps here, and it's only a matter of 20 kilometers from the Swiss frontier as well. Lutsenko continues to try and pave a lonely trail. 
keeps looking up, hoping he'll see the summit, but he's more riders coming to join him. Well, the rider on the front all of the time has never asked for any assistance at all is Steph Clement. That's uh, him there, just sitting on the front of this group. Thomas Vogler in second position. Steve Morabito lives 30 kilometers away, Phil, uh, from uh, the race circuit today, so you could say that he's the regional of the stage. And Micah in the white polka dot jersey there, uh, he looked to be having a little bit of a difficult time in the early slopes, but very often in the early kilometers of a climb he always seems to be in difficulty and as we get further up the climb he seems to recover and find his own rhythm little more acceleration here this is a fine piece of pedaling by lee howard here as he comes up behind 20 kilometers to go as we see the riders coming up here let's check in with jens voigt yes as we can see, uh, Steph Clement doing all the work in the front here, right there. He is doing it for his teammate, and he won a stage three days ago. So he is ready to repeat that win. So I believe he is doing everything he can to keep it to keep in control. There we see number 79. He's just sitting there waiting for his day, for his moment to attack. And it would, I would be surprised if he is not looking good today and not, not trying to go for another stage win. Well, we'll see. I mentioned Lee Howard there, because I really meant to. His teammate, Steph Clement. Here comes Raphael Micah, seeing the side. I wonder if Thomas Vogel is going to try and out-sprint him as he did a couple of days ago. And um... his Vogel is just the noise he's riding. No, this time he won't. So, Rafael Micah gets the points over the top of the four class, 10 points I think it is, and uh, he's won all the points available so far today. If he wins the stage, he gets a massive 50 points, because when an all-category race ends the day, they double the points in the mountains. Now, Alaphilippe coming back from the chase group he was in. Now, all of a sudden, uh, I'm just trying to peek around the... Not any more Movistar riders doing the pacemaking. No, Vincenzo Nibali in, in earnest is doing the pacemaking. But we look down the line there is number 11 just sitting around there. Peter Sagan, well, job done for him. Uh, he's got his 20 points out on the course. Vincenzo Nibali doing an excellent job here, but he's not riding for himself, not riding for his own account here. He's trying to nurse his young prodigy, Fabio Aru, to the front end of the race. But uh, there's not very many riders left in this group when you look to the back. No. But I can still see the white jersey over on the left-hand side there of Adam Yates. And in front of him, that little bobbing style there, that's the Irish rider, Dan Martin. Uh, this is Pozzo Vivo here. No, it's not. It's Vio Moraz who's coming off the back of the pelican on as well from AG2R Pierre Roland just in front from Canadale Drapak these riders days are done Emmanuel Buchmann hasn't really ridden so well this year he came to the tour and as German champion he's dropping back there's only one rider with him now uh, Quintana and that is Valverde he's got no other helpers up there and Valverde has turned out to be an amazing ally uh, over these last few days the Olympic Games, but also trying to help Nairo Quintana do better than second position. Just on the back there with that red jersey, Alain Philippe, he's seen the ups and downs of the Tour de France, but uh, at least he's got that red, red number on his back as the most aggressive rider from the other day when we went down into Bern. I think he's got a VT, I just caught a glimpse of his, uh, his wingman, Emmanuel uh, uh, VT, also there, but a little bit further down the line, I'm afraid. Stand by for the dizzy descent here as we race down to the foot of the final climb. Right. Steph Clement knows these roads well. Just having a look at the attack going forward there, Phil. Uh, this is Steph Clement on the back of the group, and I would not be surprised if that wasn't Jarlins and Pantano who made the move on the descent. And with the man uh, who he beat to the finish in Kulos just the other day, and that, of course, Rafael Maika. I've just gone under 15 kilometres to go, and it could be a case of deja vu for these two riders when we start the last climb. So... Here we've got the riders who finished first and second on the stage in Tukulaza. Looking over his shoulder, Mike, it's all up to you, mate, for the moment. 
I know how good you can sprint when it comes to the end of a race like this, and he's doing everything he can to stay in contact. But he has managed to get himself maximum points over the top of the climber, over the Col de Focla. It was uh, Micah, Vukla, and Morabito. Vukla, normally himself an exceptionally good descender, he hasn't made the junction. These two riders now, now there is not too much. I've just noticed three kilometers to go to the start of the final climb, and it's just a shade inside of 11 kilometers of climbing up here to the uh, the heights in the Alps of six and a half thousand feet, just inside of 2,000 meters. Field where they're an awful long way behind uh, at 10 and a quarter minutes. Very shortly, about two kilometers to go, they'll have that very sharp bend. Uh, this is Bryce Fellu just on the back. Uh, the other rider in there from AG2R uh, just uh, trying to stay in contact there. That looks like it was Podsuviva.